All right. Um, let's get started then. Uh, Peter, if you will take it away. Thanks, Linda. Hi, everybody. I'm Peter Kilmark. I'm the deputy director of Fogarty and just want to welcome everyone to this virtual workshop on global health reciprocal innovation. I think we have about 60 people registered, so I hope people keep rolling in and come and go over the three days. I bring you greetings from our Fogarty director, Roger Glass. He's at the Grand Challenges meeting in Brussels, but he very much shares my enthusiasm for this topic. And over the next few mornings, we're going to hear some important examples from researchers who've identified innovations coming from low and middle income countries that address specific health issues, and they've brought those innovations back to the US or other high income country settings to address similar populations and issues. And they're examples that, that span a lot of different health areas and related areas and a lot of different types of interventions. But these include HIV and stigma, diabetes and hypertension, maternal and child health, and a lot of different in, uh, intervention modalities. And because these reciprocal innovations address many different areas of health, we at Fogarty are happy that we've, um, we've had this opportunity to partner with a large group of other NIH institutes and centers and offices, which is really what we like to do in, in our Fogarty activities. So I wanna thank and, and give a shout out to there's 13 other uh, NIH Institute centers and offices who've joined in this initiative. And I, I'm very excited to see this very diverse and excellent group of partners from the US, from around the world, from, from low and middle income countries, from other high income countries, from academia, from NGOs, from government, from the World Health Organization, so big thanks to all of you for your participation and engagement and welcome to all of you. And I, I just wanna note that this concept of re reciprocal innovation is really, at, is really at the heart of a core priority for Fogarty and for NIH. We're very interested in promoting equity in our global health research partnerships and a, a critical rationale for our global research collaboration is to engage the brightest and most creative researchers in the world. And we all know that scientific excellence and innovation is not limited within our borders. There's some really fantastic creative people that we work with around the world to our mutual benefit. And we really have a lot to learn from our colleagues in, in the global South, as, as uh, some people call it. And this, you know, by the way, this actually helps to justify our international collaborations to those who might ask, why are we funding researchers in other countries? And we can make the case that reciprocal innovation directly improves the lives of Americans. For example, some of the lessons that we're learning have been very helpful in our US initiative to end the AIDS epidemic. Um, we've gotten a lot of concrete examples developed in low and middle income countries through PEPFAR and other programs that we're bringing to bear in our Ending AIDS Initiative here in the US. So the workshop will look at the science behind global health reciprocal innovation. It's gonna address questions in implementation science and developing new uh, frameworks and methods for the field and all the time ensuring equity in conducting research and implementation. We expect that the results of the workshop will, will be made public uh, through public publications and webinars to give researchers and funders a roadmap for um, utilizing global health reciprocal innovation research, again, to our global mutual benefit. And I just wanna thank Linda Kupfer. Um, Linda actually started working at Fogarty 20 years ago in, in 2002. And over her 20 years of service, she's had really a lot of high impact accomplishments. And this will be one of her final contributions as she's going to be um, leaving us uh, at the end of this year. And I just want to close in really thanking all of you uh, for participating, for join a, joining us. And again, my personal excitement about this field and my commitment, our commitment from Roger and me to continue to support this and highlight this in the future. So thanks, everyone. And uh, back over to you, Linda. 
Thank you so much, Peter, for your words of will welcome. Um, I am truly thrilled to see everyone here at the Global Health Reciprocal Innovation Workshop. I'm Linda Kupfer, and along with my colleagues from 13 NIH Institute Centers and Offices, ICOs, we welcome you as the hosts of this workshop. For the next two days, we will listen to researchers describe their Global Health Reciprocal Innovation, GHRI, projects. And on the third day, we will also hear from funders who will describe their interests in GHRI research and their programs. The presentations will all address different aspects of GHRI research. Following the presentations, we will discuss how to capture the examples and opportunities that have been presented, as well as address the gaps and barriers that have been identified. So we can move this research forward. Next slide, please. For my presentation, I will give some context to the GHRI workshop by addressing the following questions. What is reciprocal innovation? How did the NIH Global Health Reciprocal Innovation Project evolve? What are the goals of this workshop? And finally, what exactly will we be doing for the next three days? Next slide, please. We will start with a definition of GHRI that we can use for this workshop. And it will give us the ability to better understand each other and communicate for the next three days and beyond. At this workshop, we will use the characterization of reciprocal innovation from a recently published paper by Soares et al. Reciprocal innovation is the bi-directional and iterative exchange of a technology, methodology, or process between countries, usually a low and middle income country, LMIC, and a high income country, HIC to address common health challenges and provide mutual benefit to both sides. Lessons learned are continually shared throughout the process to suit the needs and infrastructure of each country. The source publication supplied not only the definition in words, but also in a picture seen here. On, I don't know about you, but I really like the use of people and their hands and not arrows in this picture to depict how innovation travels around the world. Next slide, please. With the example on this slide, we acknowledge that the concept of innovation flowing from LMICs to HICs is not a new concept. In 2008, the National Library of Medicine exhibit Against the Odds, Making, difference, making a Difference in Global Health, several in innovations from LMICs that were transferred to the US were highlighted. One was the innovative health center founded on a Zulu tribal reserve in South Africa in 1942 by South African doctors, Sydney and Emily Kark. The Karks found that the rural population they served needed more than just access to medical care to be healthy. They needed to address poverty and its health impact on the population. Through the clinic, the doctor's car provided services addressing housing, sanitation, and access to food in addition to health care. Their innovative, holistic approach to health inspired a U.S. medical student, Jack Geiger, when he visited the South African Health Center in the 1950s. In the 1960s, Dr. Geiger developed the Delta Health Center in Mound Bayou, Mississippi, modeled after the health center in South Africa. The Delta Health Center offered, a healthcare, offered healthcare and services to address issues such as hunger and unemployment in Mound Bayou. This innovative, comprehensive approach to health was, over the next years, integrated into community health centers throughout the U.S. Next slide, please. 
I would also like to acknowledge that this area of research has had many terms to describe it over the years. Each name was used to emphasize a different aspect of the research. For example, reverse innovation emphasizes the expectation that innovation usually flows from a high income country to a low and middle income country. But in this type of research, the innovation will flow in the reverse direction from LMICs to HICs. The fact that innovations created in LMICs are frequently low cost and therefore more affordable in low and min middle income setting is captured by frugal innovation. And global to local research conveys that innovations developed globally, specifically in LMICs, can be transferred and used locally in other countries, including HICs. That said, none of these names incorporate the concept of a bi-directional, reciprocal, and equitable approach to innovation development and exchange. This idea is expressed in some newer terms, such as reciprocal innovation, reciprocal learning, and bi-directional learning. Next slide, please. I would like to present three reasons we have chosen the term global health reciprocal innovation to describe this area of research. First, as I just mentioned, by using the term reciprocal innovation, we are clearly announcing our intention that this area of research should be bi-directional and importantly, benefit all parties contributing to the research. By using the words global health innovation, we are being as broad as possible to include methods, ideas, products, and interventions that affect health around the world. And finally, by naming this area of research global health reciprocal innovation research, and by identifying systematic ways to conduct and report this type of research, we intend to make certain that innovations from LMICs will be appropriately acknowledged also, we hope that people around the world will realize that health innovations that have been developed in LMIC can benefit all people, including those in high income countries. Next slide, please. Now I would like to switch focus and tell you about the evolution of the Global Health Reciprocal Innovation Project at the NIH. This project began about two years ago when a group of NIH colleagues formed a work group to understand the landscape of LMIC to HIC innovation transfer in the context of the announcement of the initiative ending the HIV epidemic in the US. As a first step, we issued a request for information for researchers to submit projects involving the transfer of an innovation from an LMIC to the US. We were especially interested in HIV innovations. We received 21 submissions and following interviews with the PIs invited four researchers to present their work at a well-attended webinar focused on stigma and HIV. At the same time, we asked all our colleagues to look for research supported by their ICOs that had incorporated global health reciprocal innovation research. We followed these activities by conducting a scoping review of the literature on global health reciprocal innovation research, and we finished that scoping review this summer. Next slide, please. For the scoping review, we used a very broad search criteria for GHRI publications, and our search produced 6,000 publications, for which we con conducted title and abstract reviews. Those reviews led to identification of 64 publications for the full text reviews. We finally extracted data from 12 papers that met our criteria. For the ne our next step will be to analyze the data we collected and publish the review. I want to note that we had a wonderful team of five researchers conducting the scoping review. Their names are at the bottom of this slide. Next slide, please. Combining all of the information that we had acquired to date through the RFI from our NIH colleagues and through the scoping review, 
we developed this Global Health Reciprocal Innovation Research uh, Workshop. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. The goal of this workshop is to bring together researchers and funders interested in or with experience in the field of global health reciprocal innovation research and to discuss the state of the field and the path forward for this area of research. We will reach this goal by highlighting case examples of GHRI research, stating the opportunities afforded by GHRI research, examining barriers to conducting research in this area, exploring the methodology and frameworks relevant to GHRI research, including describing the research gaps, discussing how best to ensure that GHRI research is conducted equitably, designing a roadmap for the future of GHRI research, and finally, we will outline publications and identify journals, excuse me, for the dissemination of our workshop discussions. Next slide, please. We will accomplish these goals and objectives through panels, breakout groups, and a roundtable discussion over the next three days. On day one, panelists will present on models, opportunities, and barriers when conducting GHRI research. The breakout groups that follow the panel presentations will allow all workshop participants to share their own experiences in this area and for the group to delve deeper into the topic. On day two, Panelists will present on GHRI methods, frameworks, and GHRI research gaps. This will again be followed by breakout sessions. Participants will be assigned to the same breakout group, one, two, or three, for the entirety of the workshop. Also on day two, panelists on panel three will present on equity in the law as it affects GHRI research. Again, this will be followed by breakout sessions. Day three will consist of short presentations by several of the NIHICs, our colleagues from HRSA, the Health Resources and Services Administration, and some other funders of GHRI research, such as AARP and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. They will all describe their interest in GHRI and any programs they have that support this type of research. The second half of the day on day three will be spent discussing what papers we will write together to capture the discussions in this workshop and to map out a path forward for GHRI research. Please note that you all should have received short bios for all our panelists, moderators, facilitators, and note takers. Please refer to these bios as we move through the agenda. This will allow us to stay within the allotted time for each session. Next slide, please. This is the schedule for the rest of the day today. Panel one will present for 50 minutes. This will be followed by a 20 minute Q&A. We will take questions for all the panelists during the Q&A. And if you have questions during the talk, please put them in the chat. After the Q&A, we will have a break, but first you will be put into breakout groups. You can take the five minute break at the start of the breakout discussion, which will last for 45 minutes. We will then come back into the large group as a plenary and the facilitators of each of the breakouts will present some highlights from their group's discussions. If there is time, we will have a Q&A following the facilitator's presentation. The workshop will end at 11, a.m. Eastern time today, and it will start again at 7.55 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow. Next slide. And now, <clears throat> before I introduce the moderator for our first panel, I want to thank the many people that helped to pull this workshop together. It truly takes a village and a big thanks to everyone. Now I would like to introduce your moderator for panel one, Diane Roche, my colleague from the National Institute of Mental Health, NIMH, here at the NIH. Diane is the director of the Office on AIDS at NIMH, and Diane and NIMH 
have been involved with this project from the start. Diane, over to you. Thank, thank you, Linda, and uh, welcome everyone to this to the first panel. Um, I want to remind the um, I'm very excited to be here, and it's been a journey, but it's been a lot of fun. And Linda, I didn't know you were leaving soon, but it's been great working with you. So uh, I just want to remind the presenters that to keep on time, I will let you know when you're getting close. I'll give you a nine minute, uh, one minute warning. So for our first uh, 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 lecture, it will be uh, Dr. Janet Turin from the University of Alabama on the fresh intervention, finding respect and ending stigma around HIV. Janet. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with this group. And yes, I'm gonna talk about an intervention that we've been working on in various settings globally, uh, which is meant to reduce stigma and discrimination in healthcare settings. Next slide, please. So this intervention was originally developed through uh, an R01 study that was conducted in five African countries. There was a, a mechanism, I believe through Fogarty that funded many different stigma projects quite some years ago now. But this, this project was developed by a multidisciplinary team with investigators from Lesotho, Malawi, South Africa, Swaziland, and Tanzania. And my mentor, Bill Holtzmer, was part of that team. And that's how I, I became exposed to this intervention. And it's, it's a really solid intervention for stigma reduction because it's very well grounded in interpersonal contact theory and also social cognitive theory. And it has different elements. Um, I think you need to click. Who's ever advancing the slides, please click. Yes. Uh, it's got sort of three components. One is sharing information. So you do actual local data collection on stigma and share that information and how stigma actually impacts people living with HIV or other conditions that you're working on. Really important key part of the intervention is increasing contact with the affected group. And it involves bringing together health workers, people who are delivering care in clinics and people who are living with HIV to actually work together, get to know each other and plan stigma reduction activities. And the last component is, uh, is, is around empowerment. If you can click again, thank you. So really working with the clients uh, to actually allow them to get engaged in an activity which they can actually work on addressing and fighting back against stigma, not just accepting it or living, it, living with it. So this is a, a really promising intervention. And when I uh, did move my professional my, my university home to University of Alabama, we started thinking about how this might work in, in the Alabama setting. So please, next slide. So of course, you know, there are some elements of stigma that are, are quite universal. We've learned through quite a, many, many years of stigma research that there are some common things. And, but we also know that context is important, right? Um, Although we all we agreed that the idea of bringing actually clients and providers together to address stigma together, it seemed transferable. But we knew when we were going to adapt it for Alabama that we really had to take into account the very different context in the U.S. South. So the health system is different. The clients are different. The social con cultural context of communities is different. Socioeconomic uh, status. And then importantly, we this was when we became really cognizant of the importance of intersectional stigma and not just thinking about HIV stigma in, in isolation. Next slide. So um, we were lucky to get some funding from our uh, Center for AIDS Research, the CIFAR, through a supplement. We, had a, we were able to form a scientific working group around stigma reduction. And this got us some initial funding to start figuring out how we could adapt this intervention for Alabama. And I think as we're all gonna emphasize that adapting intervention takes some good 
good work with the people who actually are living in the place where you're trying to adapt from. So we collected data and analyzed it from at-risk populations in Alabama. We did a big survey of public health and primary health care workers, and we did qualitative research with people with living with HIV. So this work was jump-started through the CIFAR funding, and also we had um, a intramural funding from our School of Public Health, a little funding called Back of the Envelope Award. So we pieced together little bits of funding so we could try to figure out what this adapted intervention would look like. Thank you. Next slide. And so the research, what does the workshop, what does it look like? This is the sort of as was adapted for Alabama. We started out, we start out with understanding stigma. So we're, again, we're bringing health workers and clients together in maybe it's a one and a half to two day workshop, depending on how it works in each setting. We learn about understanding stigma. We do a lot of interactive exercises to understand intersectional stigma and how different stigmas related to different parts of who we are affect our lives. We learned about outcomes of stigma. We always do an HIV knowledge update because it's important to, for us to all be on the same page on that. And then we have an important session on how we can challenge and resist and help each, ourselves to cope with stigma. And then the participants work together to develop stigma reduction strategies for their setting. Thank you. Next slide. So, you know, how did we modify this intervention for Alabama? We ended up including participants from across the city, not just from specific health facilities. We held the workshop in a neutral location. Uh, people didn't really want it to be at the HIV clinic or the public health department. They wanted it to be someplace where everyone felt free and comfortable. We had to make the workshop shorter because people didn't have time to spend uh, in, in a workshop. And we definitely had to develop new content on intersectional stigma. And we so we had to address racism. We had to address homophobia. We had to address all these things that intersect with HIV related stigma in, in our setting. And we made them come, their projects were focused not just on their own clinic, but on the larger population of health workers in, in the area. Next slide. Um, so th this was, a, that was a small pilot project, but it really has jump-started um, additional work and fresh reciprocal innovation is continuing. Um, we got a, 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 a good national CFAR supplement to collect baseline data from clients and providers at seven clinics across Alabama and Tennessee. And right now we're working on how can we now use those data uh, to further adapt and test the intervention at more clinics across the US South. So that's something that we're actively trying to get funded right now. But then in another phase, we got we were lucky to get uh, support from Fogarty through an R21, uh, a special HIV stigma mechanism, to actually adapt and pilot this for the Dominican Republic with a, a more tighter focus on MSM and transgender clients. Next slide. And so that's something we've been working on in the past couple of years, again, with Fogarty support which has been very exciting. And I guess, you know, Dominican Republic is really considered a middle or high income setting, right? It's, uh, so I don't know, we went from Sub-Saharan Africa to Alabama, and now we're going to the Dominican Republic and, and beyond. Um, our, so again, as all of these projects starting with good formative adaptation research. So doing qualitative research, again, with clients and health workers in that setting and um, using an adaptation framework, a formal framework with steps, and then use, but using rapid qualitative analysis to be able, enable us to get the results quickly and get this uh, adaptation going. We focused on sexual and gender minority people living with HIV, and our workshops included both MSM and transgender women as interventionists and participants. One minute. What? Thank you. 
We added a module on structural stigma and discrimination, which wasn't in the original uh, intervention, which really focused on laws and policies. And we adjusted the coping model to focus more on strengths and resiliencies for challenging stigma. Thank you, next slide. And oh, we also added material on uh, intersectional stigmas around sex work and migrant status. And our workshops in this case were based in single clinics, but they were conducted over the weekend at an offsite location. So again, several modifications, keeping the core, but mod some modifications for the context. Thank you. And so in summary, I would just say the key points for us in terms of successful global health reciprocal innovation are really working collaboratively with the team members from the different settings. And when we're possible using MPI models to actually share leadership of the work. We know we have to stay true to the essential ingredients of the intervention, but we also need to adapt to the context uh, using rigorous intervention adaptation methods. And um, I'm hopeful that we'll be sharing materials that can be easily adapted to different settings globally. And you can see some of our great team members here. Thank you. And here are many, many, many more people who've been involved in this program of research. Thank you. Thanks very much, Janet. Uh, that was very interesting. And I just want to remind um, everyone, if you have questions, to please put them in the chat. We'll take questions after all the speakers during our discussion session. Okay, our next talk will be from Al Lu from the San Francisco Department of Public Health to talk about PrepMate by Welltel, digital health intervention, innovation to support PrEP engagement. Al. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks uh, for the invitation to be part of this um, great workshop. Um, so today I'll be talking about um, uh, PrEP made by Welltel, which is um, a case example of um, GHRI. Um, and next slide. Um, so uh, just a little bit of background. Um, the technology um, that we were interested in um, is called Welltel. It's a digital health um, communication platform uh, that um, was originally developed uh, to support uh, patient-centered engagement and adherence to HIV treatment um, for people living with HIV in Kenya. Um, and the intervention involves using text messaging, um, bi-directional um, uh, texting uh, that starts with an automated check-in that's a weekly check-in to from the clinic to patients, asking them how they're doing. Um, and for uh, patients who respond that they're not doing well, um, the staff reach out with additional uh, support. Um, so this intervention was initially evaluated in RCT um, by uh, Dr. Rich Lester um, uh, and found that it um, increased both um, antiretroviral um, uh, adherence as well as viral suppression. Um, and the results were published in The Lancet and formed uh, the basis, if you can click to the next um, slide, great, um, formed the basis of um, including SMS texting for adherence um, in the consolidated uh, WHO consolidated H um, ARV guidelines um, in, back in 2013 um, and, um, and really kind of uh, put texting uh, for, um, adherence support um, uh, on the map. Next slide. Um, so when we um, learned about Welltel and its uh, positive impact on um, HIV treatment adherence, we became really interested in whether we could adapt it for um, HIV negative people taking uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, or PrEP, um, a daily pill for HIV prevention. Um, and through an NIMH R01, um, we were able to develop and test a, this mobile health strategy for PrEP support um, in the US. Um, and so we called this um, intervention PrEPmate. Um, it kept the core functionality of WellTel, which was the weekly check-in, um, uh, but we adapted some of the check-in messages, as you can see here, asking um, how is PrEP going? Um, uh, and then we also, um, added some additional features um, uh, that were web-based, um, including um, information about PrEP, um, testimonials from peers taking PrEP, as well as a discussion forum. 
Um, next uh, click. Um, and we collaborated with um, Dr. Sybil Hosek at the Chicago Core Center, um, uh, which is focused um, on young uh, men who have sex with men uh, to see um, whether uh, this uh, strategy could be helpful. And we were interested in young men who have sex with men because it was a population that um, had uh, demonstrated low um, lower adherence uh, and persistence on PrEP, as, as well as high use of uh, mobile um, texting uh, and technologies. Next slide. Um, so in terms of how we did the adaptation, we used a human-centered design process um, uh, to really figure out how to tailor the intervention for youth uh, in the US. Um, and um, one of the um, issues we initially encountered was that the technology that was built for um, use in Kenya was not, the platform was not available um, in the US. And so we had to find um, a new technology partner in the US, um, which we um, engaged. Uh, and so we went through this human uh, centered design process, which began with mapping out the journey, the prep journey, um, which you can see at the bottom of the screen from awareness to PrEP all the way to um, people um, uh, being on PrEP uh, for a longer period of time. And we gathered um, uh, uh, youth as well as um, community stakeholders in a co-design process um, where we asked people what they thought um, could be um, ways to really um, engage uh, youth in, in the intervention and had them draw out their, um, their uh, ideas. And you can see some of the ideas here. Next slide. Um, so um, as uh, when we finalized the intervention, we tested it in an, um, an RCT called EPIC, um, where we randomized young men who have sex with men as well as trans women age 18 to 29 to receive PrepMate versus standard of care. Um, and you can see on the left here, um, we, um, uh, in the green is uh, PrepMate participants and, and the red standard of care. Um, and in terms of visit retention through um, 36 weeks, we demonstrated a improvement in um, across uh, various time points. Um, and, and if you can click, the other side. Um, and then we also looked at PrEP adherence in terms of um, uh, uh, drug levels and dried blood spots and also showed um, improvements across various time points. Next slide. Um, this is the original publication in Clinical Infectious Diseases. Next uh, slide or next click. Um, and um, CDC did identify PrepMate as um, an evidence-based, uh, one of the evidence-based um, strategies to support both retention and PrEP care, as well as PrEP medication adherence and persistence. Next click. Um, and very recently, just earlier this month, um, based on a systematic review, um, the Community Preventive Services Task Force um, uh, uh, came out with a recommendation for digital health interventions, um, including PrepMate, to um, increase adherence to HIV uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, and they said that this recommendation is supporting the ending the HIV um, epidemic in the U.S. initiative. Next click. And um, since then, as after you know, several years have passed since we initially started the study, Welltel actually. Um, uh, adapted their platform to um, be able to work in the U.S. Uh, as well as Canada, and so we have integrated uh, the Welltel back in or prep made back into Welltel, um, and now are partnering with them uh, uh, to scale up um, prep made within the U.S. Um, as in several um, ending the HIV epidemic jurisdictions um, uh, across the U.S. Next slide. Um, so I just wanted to. Um, circle back and, um, and highlight how uh, the reciprocal innovation worked in this project. Um, initially, the studies were done, the study was done in Kenya and has since expanded to other um, uh, African countries as well as uh, Peru. Um, and um, with the exchange with higher income, high income countries, um, US, Canada, and New Zealand. Next slide, or next click. Um, and so, um, this just shows that originally the Welltel idea originated 
um, originally was developed for ART support in people living with HIV, next click, um, and then was brought to the US and Canada initially to support HIV treatment, uh, but then was adapted to support um, PrEP. Um, and then other um, uh, fields became very interested in also using this approach. You can see some of the examples here, asthma, primary care, mental health, um, substance use. Next click. We also um, uh, realized important populations uh, that um, needed to be included um, were uh, Spanish-speaking populations and transgender and non-binary populations. And so through um, a um, uh, grant sponsored by Gil or supported by Gilead, we um, did uh, formative work uh, to adapt PrepMate for Spanish-speaking populations as well as trans and non-binary. Next click. Um, and then this shows examples of um, um, it kind of coming full circle but, um, with uh, uses of PrepMate in, or WellTel in um, LMICs um, for HIV um, and PrEP support, TV programs, um, more recently COVID-19 contact tracing, as well as um, prevention of maternal and child transmission and um, maternal, newborn, and child programs. Next slide. One minute. Thank you. Um, so I just want to end with um, highlighting some of the opportunities and barriers um, in terms of opportunities. Um, uh, you know, we were really interested in digital um, health in innovations, and um, Welltel had already established an evidence base for improving adherence, engagement, and satisfaction. They already had experience um, and lessons learned with implementation. For example, we had questions about how much um, level of staffing was needed for the clinics and sites. And um, there were a lot of insights that we uh, gained from the implementation in Kenya. Um, also, um, we had Rich Lester was one of our um, co-investigators on our project and was an active um, collaborator in the design process. Um, and you can see that um, it has broad utility across borders and disciplines. In terms of the barriers, um, we did have to find a new technology vendor um, initially and had a number of initial challenges. Um, initially, we at the time did not have a roadmap for the adapt adaptation process. And, um, and um, so uh, that was um, sort of forging a new path. Um, and then we've encountered a number of local um, data security and compliance requirements that are different in the US versus um, LMICs. Um, including um, HIPAA regulations and um, every institution has their own privacy regulations around texting. Um, and finally, um, due to differences in the payment models and complex insurance and financing in the US that we've really had to think about different sustainability strategies um, uh, for um, prep made by Welltel in the US. Next slide. Um, and this is just um, acknowledgments of the team that was developed and tested PrepMate, WellTel, and um, NIMH, as well as the study participants. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a very interesting talk. And we'll move on to the next one, which will be from Josephine Van Ullman and Caroline Vascular. And I'm sorry if I mispronounced that name, but, um, and they are from the University of Antwerp in Belgium. And their title is Reciprocal or Reverse Innovation. Go ahead. Thank you, Liam. And indeed, uh, nice to be here from the other side of the ocean. Actually, I was yesterday in Brussels at that event of Global Health Challenges. So uh, the bridge has already been made uh, unawarely then. Um, our presentation, which I will be doing together with Caroline Mascalier, the French uh, way of pronouncing in Belgium as a bilingual country, um, uh, already poses in the title um, one of the, um, the tensions which um, was also mentioned by Linda in her introduction. Is it reciprocal? Is it reverse? Um, um, in fact, what we do in the next slide, you see that we present two projects. One of them already finished, another one just about to start in which uh, we show both sides of the uh, coin. The left project, which has the acronym SMART2D, was um, on reciprocal learning, uh, whereas the run on the right, which is about to start, 
uh, has more probably the focus on reverse innovation. But there are other differences there as well. Um, the one on the left is spe disease specific. The one on the right really addresses a very horizontal generic topic of access to primary care. Very, very wide. Um, whereas the one on the left is self-management diabetes, seemingly more concise, therefore not complex. I don't need to tell you that. Both in three countries, but um, in the left uh, Smart2D project, all of the sites were uh, sites where we went all the way, as you want to say, we left all at the same place and um, we all had to uh, design, implement and evaluate um, basically a, a common intervention. That was the idea. Whereas uh, in the right side project, um, Brazil and South Africa are the, the sites where Belgium is learning from a bit more similar with the two other presentations we've just heard. Um, so that also has implications in how much resources are available in each setting and, and maybe also in terms of how you, what is the real learning at each site and how are the relationships uh, and maybe even in terms of uh, equity. Uh, I think that's for a next session tomorrow, definitely. Uh, we used two different uh, models, and that was the highlight of today's session. So I will present the Smart2D study, um, which uh, was focused on how to um, make a self-management approach or intervention uh, for type 2 diabetes, um, and to do that through reciprocal learning. I think in the original, uh, we said transfer, but the paper which Linda found and the basis on which I was invited, we already framed that to learning. So the three settings were vastly different. It was a rural setting in Uganda where there were, uh, where we worked with patient groups in the end. It was, that is the right side uh, picture you can see on the slide. It was um, a very urban setting in Cape Town, South Africa, where there were um, community health workers who set up support groups. That's the middle uh, picture. And on the left was Stockholm, uh, um, this privileged neighborhood in Sweden, where we also wanted to set up uh, community groups, uh, but in the end turned out. The work we used was the evidence intervention triangle, which was uh, uh, came originally from the American Journal of Public Health, uh, developed in the US with the basic intention to align science with policy and practice. Um, so it has three angles. Yeah, thank you for putting the next slide. Um, it's uh, on one hand having a number of uh, evidence-based interventions. Uh, on the other uh, side, how to have an implementation process. Um, and on the third, uh, access um, having measures to monitor what you're doing and to progress on a longitudinal timeline. Um, and then at the very center of the triangle, so permeating all of the different access is um, um, how you engage in an active way with key stakeholders um, and the scientific evidence. The context in the original framework in the center, there's also context in this particular particular uh, project, we didn't put it in the center because it was so self-evident from the three settings that context was a key issue um, that it was there even without speaking, I think. Um, so what the how we used the framework was that we made um, learning cycles. In fact, for each of the three uh, rectangles, we made a separate learning cycle, which was facilitated by one particular country, um, and which was um, facilitated through a five-day face-to-face workshop for each learning cycle, which we did over the four years in which the project ran. So the first learning uh, cycle was on problem clarification and theory of change development. Um, and we had qualitative uh, research to guide that. Um, and uh, we came together on a common theory of change. Um, 
on, uh, which basically focused on the patient provider interaction and the responsiveness of the health services and how they influenced involvement of patients and the opportunities for self-management. And that also revealed the opportunities and threats for a potential intervention. Then in the second round, we came to a common intervention framework, which um, had in the end focused more on, uh, on joint. We came up with five joint intervention components, but what turned out to be more functions than particular interventions, because to, um, for instance, peer support was a main function, which was across all the three sites, but um, how that would work out in the three sites ended up to be very differently. Uh, I can explain that more in a discussion center later. And then the third element was uh, how we implement and how we would then uh, monitor it. Um, so I think the, the framework has really helped um, to bring something um, uh, together, which uh, made up an implementation an intervention in each of the sites, which was implemented in each of the sites, which had a, a common uh, commonality still, but also a lot of uh, contextualization. And um, um, you can read all of that in the papers which came from that. The challenges were, if you talk about contextualization, which elements, which level of the context is relevant uh, and how do they interrelate? And barriers, I think were also already mentioned, time. So the different time paths in each country were really challenging and also led to friction between the teams sometimes and a way to help overcome frictions was to build a lot of cross-sectional relationships within the teams with the external uh, stakeholders in each side, but also at different levels across the team. So uh, juniors with seniors from different sides, juniors apart. So we had really a network in which at multiple uh, levels, relationships were there and if friction um, was there in one of them, you could adapt that uh, maybe through a side way otherwise. The last lesson, the facilitators, I think we talk about that later, but the, the big lesson we put in our final process evaluation paper was that finally uh, we didn't analyze the results for a joint a cohort across all the three countries. So we didn't focus so much on generalizability of, uh, of lessons, but more on transferability of the intervention. Um, I hope Caroline still has enough um, time to present the upcoming project, which has a slightly different focus. So the next slide and the word is to Caroline. Thank you so much, Josephine. Um, so I'll focus on the second project that will focus on access to care for people living in socioeconomic vulnerable um, circumstances in Belgium. And we will start in January 2023. Sorry, and we will make use you of the one minute. Oh my God. Okay, then I will... <laughs> Be really brief. We will use the ADAPT framework by the Decipher uh, colleagues at the University of Cardiff, where stakeholder engagement is really their cross-cutting principle, uh, where equality and co-creation comes into play. And then I think if I really have to summarize their framework in a nutshell, is that it is key to, um, to translate the, the, the key function is functionings of an intervention in between contexts so that you go deeper than purely the, the way in which you uh, deliver an intervention, but that you also look at the key functionings that make that inf intervention work in one context and then be able to translate that functioning to the other context. So that's what we're going to try to do by learning from a model in Brazil and South Africa. Um, and try to adapt that to the Belgian um, context. As you can see here in the work packages, I'm happy to go into detail in the discussion later on about how we want to approach this, or you can always send Josephine and myself an email for further details. But then I'll um, go to the next slide, um, where we see like our initial, like the setup of our project is more the reverse innovation, but then with a really important note, um, that is 
that we couldn't agree more uh, with colleagues uh, Skopek and um, Professor Harris, who will be presenting tomorrow as well, I think, that this is quite a problematic term, as Linda also already um, told us, um, that in innovation normally flows from high to low income settings, and that it actually undermines the shift of knowledge transition uh, translation that it seeks to promote. So in this research project, we really want to see it as an opportunity for mutual learning to build those more equitable partnerships. But we are still looking into the possibilities of how can we evolve from this more reverse innovation to genuine reciprocal innovation in a context where you have, as Josephine already said, different settings with different involvement and different funding opportunities for all the settings, which is different from the uh, project that Josephine already um, presented earlier. So I'll leave you with this question and perhaps it can um, give us food for thought for the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Chris Longenecker from the University of Washington, who will speak on reciprocal innovation to improve hypertension care for people living with HIV in the USA and Uganda. Chris. Hi there, and good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me well. Uh, you'll, I'll say next, I have a number of animated elements there. So if anyone <laughs> wants to get in touch with me, I have my email and my uh, Twitter handle there. I am the director of the Global Cardiovascular Health Program here at the University of Washington. Uh, and Global Health Reciprocal Innovation is really um, a key value of ours here in this new program. So I'll tell you a little bit about my work um, in HIV, but there are some other colleagues uh, on the call today I'd like to uh, recognize, including Louisa Brandt from uh, UFMG. Hi, Louisa. We work together on a, on a systolic heart failure project in reciprocal innovation. And then um, I think Emi Okello is on as well from the Uganda Heart Institute and Rajesh Vedanthan uh, from NYU. Um, so next slide, please. So um, I don't think this uh, graphic um, is going to be unfamiliar to most people since uh, there are many HIV folks in the audience, uh, but we uh, believe that um, the HIV treatment cascade um, can not only be extended uh, upstream, as many people have described for HIV prevention, but also for those um, who are increasing in numbers, uh, who have achieved the third 95 of suppression of the HIV viral load in the blood by, by ART, we believe that for these people, it's really time now to extend the HIV treatment cascade for the prevention of non-AIDS comorbidities. Um, and as a cardiologist, I'm most interested in preventing cardiovascular disease, which includes um, managing uh, hypertension and cholesterol. Uh, first of all, diagnosing high blood pressure and cholesterol, managing it appropriately, and then reaching blood pressure and cholesterol goals uh, to prevent adverse cardiovascular outcomes. Um, so that's gonna be the basis of what uh, these next two projects are that I'm gonna talk about. Next slide, please. So we have, uh, we have two projects going on, uh, one of which uh, is funded by U01 from NHLBI, um, a nurse-led intervention to extend the HIV treatment cascade for cardiovascular disease prevention. This is extra CVD being conducted in the United States at three academic uh, medical centers, uh, two in Cleveland and one at Duke. And then um, the second project, which is um, a UG3, UH3 phase award, also funded by NHLBI, called Strengthening the Blood Pressure Care and Treatment Cascade for Ugandans Living with HIV Implementation Strategies to Save Lives, um, called Polesa Uganda. This is um, uh, a, a larger um, cluster randomized trial of two different uh, hypertension integration strategies in HIV clinics in Uganda. We're testing a relatively low touch intervention, which is simply providing blood pressure cuffs and, uh, and uh, medications uh, to clinics. And then secondly, a, mo uh, a more complex multi-component intervention that layers on um, additional things such as audit and feedback, uh, practice facilitation, other implementation strategies. Um, so I, I'm not going to go into detail about these projects. Um, I'm happy to talk more about them uh, in, in uh, the breakout sessions, uh, but I wanted to highlight three areas, um, if you could click next. 
um, that, that really have been the focus of shared knowledge across um, the projects. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Raj Vedanthan, who was, is a key um, co-investigator on the Extra CBD product, project. Uh, and, and he had been uh, working in, uh, has been working in, in Kenya um, on projects that use task sharing to, um, to improve uh, hypertension care uh, for people in Kenya. Uh, we used core components of that for designing the nurse-led intervention in the United States. Um, and then also besides, uh, you know, specific uh, interventions, um, I think just process um, was shared a lot across both of these projects. Um, in particular, we used a human-centered design uh, approach to uh, moving from a formative phase uh, where we had been gathering uh, um, mixed methods uh, uh, data on the context to designing the intervention and adapting interventions uh, to the local context. Um, and what was key there is that we had um, a facilitator, uh, Angela Afa from uh, the United States, uh, who uh, was involved with both projects. So I think having someone uh, who is actually the same person uh, working in both uh, contexts was, was helpful. And then thirdly, a remote patient monitoring is a big part of both of these um, interventions, um, blood pressure monitoring in particular, but thinking about how we do blood pressure monitoring uh, is complex. Um, and there were a lot of different ways in which the extra CVD intervention um, informed the development of PALESA um, and now PALESA informing per potential future iterations of extra CVD. Um, so next slide, please. Um, these two projects uh, were part, uh, each one was part of an alliance of several other projects working um, in the same area. So in the case of Extra CVD, we were part of the uh, Preclude Consortium that NHLBI funded. This includes um, five different projects in the United States, all working to improve um, heart, lung, and blood disease care for people living with HIV in the U.S. And then the Palesa project is part of the HLB Simple Consortium. Um, and that consortium is six projects in Sub-Saharan Africa working to uh, integrate hypertension care uh, into routine HIV care uh, on the continent. So uh, for AIDS 2022, we brought together the investigators of, of these projects um, in one forum and held a workshop. Um, and, and many of you uh, were, were part of that, um, where the investigators could talk to, to each other about lessons learned in, in each of the projects submitted a video abstract describing one key pearl. Um, and then there was a panelist, uh, panel of uh, PIs from the various projects uh, discussing what uh, interesting pearls uh, from the other context might work in their context. Uh, so we, we really enjoyed that, um, that session. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this just shows where uh, the Preclude Consortium sites are um, in the United States. Um, we have summarized uh, the Preclude Consortium in a, in a publication there uh, in progress in CVD in 2020, if anyone is interested. Uh, next slide, please. These are the HLB Simple Consortium sites um, working to improve uh, hypertension care for people living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then uh, next slide. Uh, just another acknowledgement of Angela Afa, who uh, received a diversity supplement for our extra CVD uh, study, um, and then has been very active in helping not only our project uh, in Uganda, the Palesa project, um, to, to, to develop our, um, our intervention, uh, but also is a part of the Nigeria project. And so um, something I'd like to highlight here as a key facilitator of reciprocal innovation is the extent to which the investigator network, the social network of the investigators um, can be as, as well networked as possible. So you have multiple people working on multiple projects. And I think that that helps um, kind of facilitate the flow of innovation. Um, next slide, please. Um, you know, something that we care a lot about at the um, uh, University of Washington is, is, is training. And um, in our new Global Cardiovascular Health Program, we've wanted to think a lot about reciprocal uh, training opportunities, uh, not just reciprocal innovation. And I think one idea that we've had is, is to pair um, uh, K43 uh, Fogarty awardees um, in, in low and middle income countries 
uh, with, with K-23 awardees here in the United States um, to think about how um, each of their projects might inform uh, the others um, and to actually bring people from LMICs to the United States um, to learn about our um, healthcare system here um, and, and vice versa. So uh, happy to talk more about that as well in the workshops. Um, next slide, please. So I'll, I'll just end there and, and want to really thank um, dozens and dozens of people who are involved in both of these projects that were uh, way too many to put on the slide, but um, uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, Chris, and you came in under 10 minutes. Um, okay, so our final talk will be from Deborah, Deborah Lutzelman from the University of Indiana to talk about reciprocal innovation, a new approach to equitable and mutually beneficial global health research and partnership. Deborah. Thanks, Diane and Linda. A pleasure to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm also here uh, with Laura Rule, who is in attendance of the meeting, so I want to acknowledge her. We are both from the Indiana University Center for Global Health and um, have been a long-termers with the AMPATH program. Um, and um, The title of this talk is really the title of the manuscript that Linda referred to earlier uh, that was recently published in the Global Public Health Journal. Um, it is where the definition that she's used for reciprocal innovation um, has uh, been uh, put in print. Um, the next slide, please. Um, my talk is a little different than the others in the sense I'm kind of giving a bit of a high level story of how we came to the term reciprocal innovation for our work and, um, and also how it's evolved within our uh, center in collaboration with Indiana CTSI. Um, and it really stems back from our 30 years of work with AMPATH, our program in Kenya, where we have multiple North American consortium schools that have worked with Moy University there uh, for uh, quite a long time. And I think we, we um, realized over the years that this term reciprocal innovation is exactly what others have said today, that uh, the notion of uh, methodologies and technologies developed and tested in low income countries brought back to developed countries feels less equitable and less bi-directional and less mutually beneficial than we really believe is optimal um, in terms of how we do our work together in relationship with our partners, which is really philosophically the underpinnings of our relationship with, with Kenya. Um, and then uh, again, the uh, figure from our paper uh, has been shared um, but we realized some of the icons were not clearly uh, defined there. The little I there is intended to be exchange of information. The light bulb is the co-development of uh, healthcare innovations. And the little figure with the, the little X's is uh, delivering solutions. So as Linda said, this is really an opportunity to share health challenges, share solutions, with no arrows, um, again, the notion that really this is quite complex, uh, quite organic, and uh, quite emergent um, in multiple directions, not only bi-directional, but now multi-directional as many of us work in, in multiple countries. Um, next slide. So we took this concept and uh, uh, received the attention of our CTSI many years ago, 2016, 2015, um, and they, they liked the idea. They really wanted to figure out how they might uh, put this into the application for our uh, third round of CTSIs, and that was funded. We were quite excited and went to work in figuring out how to operationalize that. So part of our work of our Indiana CTSI was to really begin the work with uh, doing local environmental scans and uh, and very focused local stakeholder meetings in, um, again, mainly in Kenya with our Kenya partners and in, in, in the US, um, but, but from both perspectives, then to come together and get a convergent a list of health priorities that we felt we could really work on mutually. Very, a very important step um, that took time, energy, and a lot of focus of the early years of our CTSI grant. Um, that would then lead to these opportunities where often there aren't 
uh, many sources of funding to develop uh, reciprocal innovation planning and demonstration grants. The innovation grants um, are, are small um, and planning grants even smaller, but we felt those were very important to give people an opportunity to even explore what it is like to begin developing the relationships and many of the things that others have talked about this morning. Um, we did create educational and training videos on reciprocal innovation because just again, as talked about this morning, this concept is not a simple one. You know, uh, how do we define projects that really, really fit this? And, um, and at any point in time, uh, it might be more uh, reverse versus um, a high income country. Uh, next slide. Um, so we went about the work of identifying those health priorities as an important starting place. And a, a product of that mutual work of uh, doing that was that we found that the top five were very similar in East Africa and Indiana. Um, no surprise, infectious disease was high in, in, in um, many countries, non-communicable disease, maternal child health, um, mental health, and access to health um, care, quality health care were at the top five, uh, which gave us then a framework for uh, where to begin with our prioritization for grant funding and so forth. Uh, next slide just gives you a little a glimpse again of the history. So in the early 2000s, I, I worked uh, uh, on a D43 grant uh, that was based in Kenya for disseminate implementation dissemination science and had a mentee working with me on maternal child health projects where she was doing a randomized control trial in the non-DT estates of Western Kenya and uh, working with community health workers and uh, SMS messaging with the women who had all had cell phones and uh, focused on social determinants of health and uh, risk behaviors that could impact infant and maternal health. Um, and she found from her research um, that there were improved outcomes for both mother and child. So looking at my own country in Indiana, where we were ranked 43 out of 50 for infant mortality rates with uh, 50 being the lowest, we said we could certainly use lots of uh, lessons learned to bring home. And with under penetration of the use of community health workers in the United States, we realized this could be quite an important uh, added addition to our workforce. So um, our own work here in Indiana with the We Care program, uh, again, focusing um, with adaptations to the United States about how to address risk behaviors and social determinants of health and using uh, a, high, a little higher tech um, and health messaging and so forth, we were also to show, able to show uh, changes in behavior and importantly, changes in birth outcomes such as low birth weight and infant mortality rates uh, in Indiana compared to our state and our high-risk zip codes that we were focusing on in, uh, in central Indiana and Marion County. And most importantly, another main focus is on equity. So these numbers show that we really targeted our very highest risk population were Black mothers and infants, and we're able to see an improvement um, comparatively. Next slide. So that's just a, an example of our early work that um, led us to uh, think again broadly about opportunities of how to even begin to think about um, where to where to put some uh, emphasis with our small grant funding. And since um, the the uh, operationalization of this with CTSI in 2016 or 17, we've had 32 grants we've awarded, um, and these are all in collaboration with uh, partners. Um, with low income countries, with the prioritized areas of uh, health focus that I've, I've shared, um, all uh, focused on bi-directional agenda. The majority are with Kenya because of our deep 30 year history, but several are also with our new partner sites where we are, have what we um, are um, developing new AMPATH partnerships in Mexico and Ghana and Nepal as well as other sites around the world where our partners at CTSI from Purdue University and Notre Dame um, also have relationships. Um, so uh, over $700,000 to date um, and we're, we're continuing. 
Next slide. Uh, so this is just another product of our CTSI work um, is to create a repository of our reciprocal innovation grants and um, catalog them for the purpose of helping to uh, share information for one, um, but also to help people identify potential collaborators and to stimulate uh, ideas about um, what else um, might one do and how else might adaptations be done. Um, there are several examples here, as I said, mainly in Kenya, but we also have partners at Notre Dame uh, who are working in Malawi and um, Purdue uh, in Lebanon, for example. Um, the very last entry there is uh, Sherry Buchner's work on, on the screen on a feasibility, adaptability, and usability of uh, a device called NeoWarm. Uh, and I'm going to uh, uh, dive down a little bit into that at Linda's request in the next two slides so we can advance. One minute. Thank you. I'm seeing only a blank screen. Um, next slide. Oh, perhaps my other slides didn't get added to this um, database. Uh, so let me just talk through it. Um, I had set those, perhaps they didn't do it, unfortunately. But uh, just to talk through it, the, the added fields, we drilled down on Sherry Buchner's work um, in, uh, in, in the active uh, website. Uh, we have several categories that the investigators would add their um, detail, a little bit more details about their projects. It would include the collaborators, the priority areas, a little bit more about the intervention, facilitators, uh, the target population, implementation, <laughs> uh, stakeholders, uh, whether this is a scaled or transferred a project type of research and publications. And just to give you a little sense of this work of Sherry's to building on the maternal child health theme is that her, uh, her device was uh, a device that um, called a neoworm to help uh, uh, avoid hypothermia in infants was trying to find a solution in low income countries uh, for babies where incubators were not available and that the mother kangaroo care was a good a good uh, product that was encouraged by HMO, but was there something um, that could make a slight advance to that? And she worked with the Purdue engineering folks to actually create uh, some special wireless sensor technology um, to add to the vital sign monitoring while the while the infant was in a skin to skin um, in the skin to skin neoworm device. Um, and the neat part was this. Uh, kind of pushing the envelope of how else might these products be uh, used as we think about innovation and where else might they be used. So it's clear that in the United States, the opioid epidemic is quite a concern and that infants born with neonatal abstinence syndrome or opioid withdrawal symptoms can be quite um, agitated and quite difficult to uh, calm. So the device is now being considered for adaptation back to the United States uh, for use with these infants where they can stay skin to skin and be calmed and used without doing um, multiple monitoring of vitals. Uh, so kind of a neat adaptation. And again, others have talked about the importance of the human-centered design, um, the multi, the uh, mixed methods approaches, uh, even using neonatal simulators was part of this project and then the publications. But just to give you a sense of this repository, um, the kinds of depth of information and how it can be used by others to kind of grow, um, to grow the whole concept of innovation and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And thanks to all the speakers. Um, we're going to now move into a, uh, a panel discussion and I invite all the, all the speakers to turn on their cameras and um, we have a number of questions in the chat um, and uh, I, I, we have 20 minutes for a discussion. So what, I'm, what I'd like to do is take a couple of questions that um, are targeted to all the, all the speakers and have some discussion. 
And then um, I invite those questions that we didn't get to in the discussion. If you could just go in and answer your individual questions to the uh, person who put the question in, that would be great. So there's three things here that really are common across common questions for everybody. And there are also things that, you know, we've been we've been funding reciprocal uh, moving of interventions for a long time at NIMH. And these are things that we've we've um, talked, discussed about a, a lot. And the first one is uh, is when you are moving um, a, an intervention from one place to another. You have to go, you have to adapt it to the culture that you're moving it to, but how do you maintain, how do you identify and maintain the critical elements of the intervention that have to be, that have to be maintained? The second question is around sustainability. What do you do to, um, I'm sorry, my, uh, I don't know if you hear these dogs barking, the contractors just got here. Um, the second thing is sustainability. How do you sustain what you're doing in the new place? What do you have to do for it? And then the third thing, um, the third thing is uh, one of the last things. Uh, uh, how, how, what's the acceptability in the high income country when they know that the intervention has been developed in a low income country? And I'm gonna go off mute until the dogs start bark, stop barking. But if you raise your hands, perhaps you can begin to oh, answer nice. these. Uh, whoever want, would like to go first, perhaps talking about critical elements. And maybe, oh, okay, go ahead, Josephine. Yeah, thank you. We have been struggling with that, but maybe more even on the way back because we really built bottom up. Um, and then, and then at a certain moment thought, what is still the common threat among it? Because it became so diversified across the context. And that's where I, finally we came up by saying the common elements are joint functions, such as peer support, such as uh, strengthen the environment. So not so much focusing on one component of the particular intervention, but even more a level higher generic. Having said that, of course, that's difficult if you then want to prove that what is it that really worked and does it work in all um, contexts. But that, that almost brings me to the, uh, to the deeper line question. Do we, do we really believe that it's the intervention per se, which it's a level of evidence, basically. Is it the intervention which works or is it the intervention plus the context which works. And maybe as a disclaimer, I come from the realist evaluation background also. So for me, it's always the interaction between an intervention and a function or a mechanism and how that relates to a context and that produces a specific evidence. So I would put that, are there essential components in an intervention a bit into perspective in itself, I think. Does Thank that you. Limit, does Janet. that limit scalability? Does that limit scalability? It Sorry, means uh, uh, Janet, were you net? Did you have a question, Paul? No, I'm sorry. I was just add, adding on to what she just said about. Yeah, it just struck me about what does that mean for sustainability. Sorry. Well, um, I think Janet, you had scalability. Some, we can move to that in a minute. If Janet, you have a uh, comment about the uh, critical elements. Sure, thank you. Yeah, and that's that also is a great point. Um, I think you know one point. One important thing is to go back to the 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 theory and the conceptual framework that really uh, grounds the intervention. And so, really thinking, you know, the essential pieces are really grounded in those theories, um, you know, in our case, interpersonal contact theory is the, one of the, the key movers of the intervention. And we can change that according to the context, what that looks like. But also then social cognitive theory and building self-efficacy is another key important. So I think going back to those conceptual and theoretical roots helps. And I also think involving, um, you know, keeping that involvement and and dialogue with the team that initially developed the intervention to, to make sure that what you're doing is, is true to what's really gonna move the needle. 
So that's that's what I was going to say. Thank you, Al. Yeah, um, this is also building on um, what um, Janet just said about theory that um, with the Welltel team, uh, they went back and used um, the implementation science approach of um, of uh, the behavioral change wheel, which allows folks to identify what are the key um, elements of um, uh, behavior change. And so they classified that the um, uh, personal communication between providers and patients was really the key um, component of uh, the Welltel intervention. So that was one that we really tried to uh, maintain, but then we brought it back to um, in the um, co-design sessions um, with youth. We really brought that back to see what what that should look like um, as part of the intervention. But it was sort of using theory to identify what were the key components. Thank you. Um, we could, you know, we can actually now talk about the sustainability, which also has an um, some impact on critical elements and how you do the study, then how do you keep it sustainable? And Paul, did you wanna add something here? I, I, I was, I invoked scalability as well. So when, when the panelists comment, maybe they can talk about sustainability as well as scalability. Um, based on uh, Josephine's comments about, the, and actually all the speakers, the importance of context and it's the interaction of the intervention and the context. Thank you. Josephine, did you wanna, you were gonna add something about sustainability also? Uh, yes, for me, they're not necessarily the same. Um, so the, um, I think, the scalability, you do that at different levels, right? So within a country, you look at scalability and there you have presumably a more homogeneous context. So yes, at, remember I put different levels of context, but at least they're the macro level context of your health system and your um, institutional context is the same. So there it's probably easier to think about scalability and think about, okay, what are indeed the implementation program and what is the, uh, the core essence then again of an intervention, what's, uh, uh, what needs to be scaled up and make that recognizable, knowing that when you scale up, you will always water down a bit of what you have proven in your RCT, but there, that is something in, in scalability terms which you can still put in, in a program, at least for diseases, for integrated care, we take a whole different approach where we much more look at institutional and health systems barriers. But if you talk about scalability from, from one country to another, and, and especially to very different contexts, like here we have taken the dichotomy, high income countries, low middle income countries, we could have a philosophical question about whether that's a just dichotomy, but anyhow, that's the one we took. Then, then scalability um, is not so much I roll out, I mean, we've seen that in all the projects that has scalability there means contextualization. I don't know if that answers your question. Thanks. I think it'll just be a continuing discussion. Uh, as we do sustainability, we talk about intervention and context, that at some point what we want to have is a public health level impact. So context is going to be, I mean, uh, context will be important in uh, determining um, scalability as well as sustainability. Al. Yeah, um, I was just going to comment from our example that um, the sustainability question really came into play when we finished our trial um, and we had to decide, you know, how are we going to um, uh, scale this up because the partner that we had, um, the local partner uh, technology uh, partner that we had chosen really was just for the study and, and they were not interested in scaling this up. And so we, you know, um, and uh, did research and interviewed a number of different tech partners that were um, 
you know, potential, potentially interested in prep meat and scaling it up. And, um, and when we went back to Welltel um, and found that they, you know, had developed their platform for use in the U.S., that um, one thing that really attracted us to them was that there we we just had a lot of shared values in terms of um, um, equity focused and making this access accessible and pricing it in a way that um, that you know a variety of both small um, you know clinics and providers as well as larger healthcare systems um, could um, uh, afford it. And, you know, they really shared the goal of, um, you know, just, you know, not profitability in the sense of just making a profit, but that, the um, you know, they did, they do need to be able to continue to support the platform and to make revisions and such, but they modeled it and they framed it in a way that, um, really maximizes equity and, um, and, um, and accessibility. And one example of a decision that they made was that, you know, many tech companies are, you know, going the route of developing apps and using smartphones and such. And they intentionally decided that they were just going to keep it with um, just sort of text messaging, which is kind of the lowest um, common um, uh, denominator of, you know, people without a smartphone, but just with a regular cell phone could use could have it accessible and and that was um that was a conscious decision that they made which we really valued as well great thank you deborah yes thank you just to add to the uh, comments about sustainability um there were uh two components i mentioned for the maternal child health that i think is are very important and key for sustainability um in certainly in the united states and possibly um, these could be applied elsewhere is the sustainability of the community health worker model. Um, very key members of the workforce for the work in Kenya. Um, now in the United States, HRSA has uh, put a uh, significant amount of money to develop community health worker development and training centers around the United States. And I think those um, centers can be quite helpful in terms of um, uh, making sure that there's uh, high quality training on core competencies and specialty competencies in any disease related area, but also interestingly enough, potentially as those uh, community health workers who may be working in with researchers to having research competencies. Um, and then moving that toward a billable activity, working with Medicaid to make sure that we push the envelope and advocacy for um, sustainable reimbursement models for community health workers to be part of the healthcare workforce is at least um, one, uh, I think, important area for forward movement. Thank you, Janet. Yeah, I'll I'll just briefly add. I, I think this when I'm thinking about the the Alabama work and the work that we're doing in the the Deep South that. As we've moved forward, we're kind of sort of trying to intentionally involve partners who are interested in stigma reduction and have some capacity and, and, and interest and motivation to continue this work afterwards. And so that's that's been part of our sort of um, our strategy. So um, Chris, uh, one one last comment i want there's a couple of questions here that i think it would be really good for the group to address um the question from rajesh about why no one from africa was on the panel and also um there uh Ch chandy john who will be the uh, uh on the panels tomorrow agrees and he asks um that some lmis some speakers from lmic um were asked but not able to, to attend. And um, the presentation have the, doesn't have, have the appearance of being um, reciprocal, but also that how do you maintain, how does the uh, in folks in the LMICs maintain their ownership and intellectual input in the work? So I think it's an important thing that if we can take the last four minutes to comment on, and Chris, I'll give you first, first First comment. Yeah, thanks, Diane. Actually, that that's why I rose my hand because I wanted to respond Great. to those comments. So uh, perfect timing. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think it's a really, really important comment. And thank you, Rajesh and, and John, for, for bringing that up. Um, one issue, I think, is that, um, that there are not many LMIC investigators who are funded to do projects in the United States. And I, I wish we could see more of that. And I think at, at Indiana, you're working to do that. Um, but I would love to see Emmy Okello, who's on the call today, uh, get an R01 to, to, to think about rheumatic heart disease care in, in Seattle at Harborview Medical Center, right? Um, I'd like to see uh, more of that type of, uh, that arm of the reciprocal innovation uh, happening. Um, so um, I hope that in, in subsequent sessions, we hear more voices from our LMIC collaborators. Um, and if we're allowed to um, ask other people to comment, I think Louisa Brandt may also have some ideas here um, on, on ways in which um, our LMIC investigators can, can be more involved. So um, Laura Rule's comment um, said that, uh, how do you engage stakeholders who are not in, involved in global health to understand the importance of this reciprocal innovation? And how do you engage those to maintain their ownership and intellectual input in the work? So does anybody wanna comment on that? So Al, maybe you can talk about Welltel because you've kept the, uh, the uh, investigators in Kenya involved or not? Yeah, um, yeah, no, we, we um, from the beginning, we um, uh, kept um, well-tell investigators um, uh, that worked in uh, Kenya um, and in other African countries um, very involved in the process um, early on with planning as well as with study implementation. And they um, were, um, you know, really, really helpful in um in really helping us understand you know what what we might expect with um, implementation and and how um how to address challenges as they came up um because a number of um uh of you know for example um people not only when we asked when we send out text messages and how people were doing people came up with a lot of things that were not at all related to um, HIV or HIV prevention, but, you know, they had um, questions about um, um, substance use or other things. And, and that was something that really came out um, in the other study, that, the original study uh, that, um, that um, you know, addressing these other um, important needs that were not necessarily HIV related, but, um, you know, childcare or other things was a really important part of um, the intervention. And so that, um, that, that shared experience was really helpful. Thanks. And Janet, you can have the last word. No, <laughs> thanks. Well, I was gonna say that um, in terms of our experience, we, we're getting a bit better about this over time. We're learning. So when we did the adaptation from the Africa study to the Alabama and the South work, we involved members of the that team, the African study team as consultants or co-eyes or, and we collaborated with them and we, we, we had them as investigators on some of the Alabama studies. But now I think with the next iteration of moving from Alabama to the Dominican Republic, we were doing better that we have you know, members of the Alabama and the um, Dominican Republic team as MPIs on, on the grant and really see, you know, people from both settings as being leaders taking it forward. Um, but I, I do think it's a, a continuing challenge and, and to, keep, to keep people involved and engaged and, and recognize the contributions uh, to not forget that is really important. Great, thank you. So I just wanna remind everyone, you can go into the chat and answer the questions that were directed at you so everybody can see the answer. And I'll turn it over to Linda now for our session to break into break groups. Thank you. And I am going to ask that we um, 
Aisha, that you put us into break groups and um, the first five minutes could be a, um, a break break. <laughs> and uh, then we can come back and have more discussion um, and uh, people can tell their own experiences in this area. Thank you so much to everyone. This was a fabulous uh, panel. Thank you. Aisha? So is everyone back? Okay, so I guess we will now turn to our uh, the, uh, the leaders of the different groups and the uh, to give us their summaries of the discussions in their group. And I guess the first one is Anna. Or no, wait, that's group two. The first one is Paul Gaze, who's group, group one. Okay, that was a surprise. I, uh, I was told that we may not be doing this. So Rena and I haven't really had a chance to um, confer on the notes and recording, but it was really quite a rich discussion. And there's so much, I don't know how I can encapsulate it, but I'll start maybe at the beginning, uh, maybe at the end, which was an emphasis on um, how reciprocal innovation um, a needs to uh, be known by folk, let's say outside of this workshop bubble, outside of within the research community, within the program community. And so there may need to be a consciousness raising campaign for reciprocal innovation. Also, there was an emphasis on training, which was also brought up in the panel. Um, there was also brought up about how to explore funding mechanisms where reciprocal innovation could be, um, can be supported and grown. Um, and there was a discussion about different ways. But one of the things that came up was even if, whether it's through supplement or otherwise, or built in event, you know, it should be built in, that not only a uh, period of funded time to do needs assessment, environmental scan, um, essentially what, what is needed in order to accurately and appropriately develop the research approach, to conduct the research approach should be part and parcel. And then to consider even a piece once the research is done, where it's like a post needs assessment of what was learned and what uh, would be, of course, I think it'd be something built into the research throughout, but it would be a dedicated fund of time for how, what, what is the um, uh, transmissibility, the translatability, the um, ability to, to um, adapt and have it uh, implemented elsewhere. So those were some of the points that were made. Um, there, the importance of understanding of, of working locally was emphasized as well. And I'm gonna stop and ask the group uh, just to pipe in if there were any other key points, because I know we only have 10 minutes for this, right? For all three groups. Any uh, key points that anyone else from the group would like to bring up? Actually, we can go more than 10 minutes per group uh, uh, for the whole thing. I think we have until 11. So you have 10 minutes each. Is that oh, correct, good. Linda? Okay, then I'm gonna, then is that correct? Then I'm gonna actually um, turn to Arena and ask her uh, to, to highlight key points from, from the breakout group because I could keep going on, but she was the note taker. For this. Go ahead, Arena. Sure. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, there was a lot of great discussion. I think uh, the key points that we came up with for um, our allotted objective for discussing and listing opportunities afforded by global health reciprocal innovation was that um, it allows for a more diverse set of investigators. Um, that includes junior investigators collaborating, working with senior investigators across countries and across regions um, to build and expand that investigators network that um, one of the presenters brought up in terms of having cross collaborations and um, also the uh, overall ability to integrate global health pu slash public health campaigns was also brought up in our discussions, uh, a way to 
translate the work um, from different places in to the United States that is sustainable, as well as keeping the humility um, uh, learning from other regions and other global areas so that we can, we don't know it all, we can learn from each other. Um, if anyone from the group, uh, again, as Paul mentioned, wants to chime in, please feel free. But I think those are kind of the highlight areas in terms of our, our objective as group one. Also part of our discussion was a bit of um, the resistance people, um, this comes under opportunities, the resistance people experience at times when they bring up um, uh, reciprocal innovation and intervention and they say, and this is evidence-based um, utilizing research that, you know, that took place in country X. And then they go, well, wait a minute. I don't know if we really want to, you know, I'm wondering in, in, in the United States, that was an example. And I don't know if, if people said, well, this was tested in Montana and we want to do it in Wyoming. For all I know, there may be resistance to that too. So we actually talked about the possibility of um, putting the intervention, uh, though we, we feel that we shouldn't have to do this, but, but sort of putting the intervention and its value and its outcomes up front and back ending that, you know, this is the evidence base was where it came, comes from, et cetera, and maybe possibly increasing buy-in. There was also a point about um, turning to successful NGOs and CBOs independent of reciprocal innovation and to how to engage with those organizations about how they've been successful in their communities and environments and um, uh, populations of focus. Uh, and there may be lessons learned for the research community in terms of um, reciprocal innovation, as well as implementation and the programs. Um, others from the group? So maybe um, unless somebody has something urgent, we can turn to group two to give each of the groups a, a, their a uh, few minutes to summarize. So Anna, did you want to take it over from there? Sure. So we had a great uh, discussion. Um, I think our group was tasked specifically, in addition to sharing examples, to talk about barriers. So maybe I'll start with the some of the barriers we discussed. So. Um, we talked about barriers related to funding uh, and how funders may structure the funding in such a way that it's harder to incorporate some of the greater kind of collaborative efforts uh, that have been discussed in some of the reciprocal innovation examples we've heard about. Um, and also how, you know, there may be funders that are kind of more in a global sphere and really understand um, and articulate themselves within the space of, of reciprocal innovation, reciprocity and collaboration. Whereas there may be local funders, state funders, you know, funders in, in countries in which the expectation is very much focused around infrastructure in the country, for example, or infrastructure in their health system. And so these components, being able to fund the collaborative components may be more complicated. So, um, you know, just talking about how the funding is structured it, itself can be a barrier for the reciprocal innovation experience and process. Um, we talked about language barriers and how language can be a barrier both for the intervention itself, you know, you're trying to translate, you may be taking an intervention that was developed in one language and trying to now use it in a different language, um, or even in the same language, you know, how things are expressed and discussed locally may be quite different and may change the meaning of some of the things that are happening, or there may be different dialects and in, in that in itself, the translation and back translation and ensuring that it, you know, fits the setting um, is a process, it could be costly um, and can represent a barrier. The other part where we talked about language as a barrier was that we're working, you know, a lot of these endeavors have teams that are in different parts of the world um, and speak different languages themselves and, and how to be able to really engage in a collaborative effort uh, when language proficiency and whatever the kind of language is most discussed within these teams may be varied. Um, and some examples of ways of addressing those barriers was to have, you know, teams that can uh, that, that have different individuals within a team, some may be more proficient in one language than another, but can help kind of uh, make sure everybody's coming along 
uh, within the process. But so language both for the intervention as well as for these collaborative efforts. Um, we also talked about language in terms of terminology and how, for example, in training and in some of these conversations with, with, with different research teams, some of the terminology may be you know, unique or may be kind of uh, something that not everybody in, in the teams are familiar with and just trying to make sure that everybody's kind of understanding each other as far as what is being discussed um, specifically, if you know you're talking about implementation science terminology, for example, with a group that's been that has developed some great innovation but may not be really articulate within those terms per se. So language, you know, a, as a barrier in many different ways. Um, we also talked about legal considerations and potential legal barriers. Um, it might be related to you know taking something from one country or one setting to another. Um, and you know, one setting maybe may have specific rules as to who can practice, for example, or who can engage in certain health activities, um, or might require, you know, just because of of the way that you know the culture is set up, it may be a culture where you know things like consents and waivers and disclosures may may be something that institutions feel need to occur, and in itself that may you know change the intervention at the very least, if not really change the spirit of whatever the intervention may be. So legal barriers in that term. We also talked about you know, legal barriers in terms of intellectual property um, and the risks of appropriation or the risks of exploitation of teams. And I know we're gonna have more discussion about that, uh, some of that tomorrow, but that was another barrier we discussed. Um, we also had a really interesting conversation around, I think, ultimately, what is reciprocal innovation? Does it require country lines, right? Is it something that needs to happen in one country and then come to a different country? Is there reciprocal innovation within the same country? I think this is dovetails a little bit on what Paul was describing. Um, and what and when is when is there an obligation to engage uh, the people who've developed an intervention and, and engage in this reciprocal uh, and collaborative effort versus taking an intervention that's published and, you know, basically the idea of generalizability. Now this intervention's published, there's an evidence base of sorts of it, and I can just take the intervention and, and kind of try to implement it in a different setting. And what does it really mean then? What's, what's different between reciprocal innovation and kind of generalizability of, of, of science that we have? You know, and when, are what, when do people really have an obligation to engage either the people who developed the intervention or who've adapted it, you know, version one, two, three, and four, versus just being able to take something from, from a publication and try to implement it in a different setting. And I think that we got cut off right then and it was a very interesting additional conversation around you know, what, what is really uh, reciprocal innovation um, and how does it, you know, and, and when, what kind of obligations do we have as people in this sphere uh, regarding engaging other colleagues uh, when we're trying to make use of, of um, evidence? I think I'll stop there. I don't know if anybody wants to say anything else. That was a pretty good summary, Anna. <laughs> anybody want to add anything? No, just echo that as a note taker. That was a fantastic summary, and I think you covered everything. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, let's turn to uh, group three, uh, Jamali Martin. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think I will uh, summarize what we discussed in the first, I guess, five minutes, um, just hitting on four main points. And then um, if anyone has anything to add, um, please feel free to chime in. Um, and so I really um, enjoyed listening to the last group because a lot of the challenges that you discuss, we kind of hit on in trying to think about models and the way we could um, uh, design those models to try and address uh, some of those challenges. So there was um, some conversation around the issue of maybe looking at the implementation science field some more and um, seeing if we could leverage some of what they have done in terms of lessons learned from the implementation science and using that model for um, 
GHRI in terms of adaption, evaluation, um, and so on. Um, there was also discussion about um, looking more at human capital design. Um, and looking at this um, uh, in terms of creating a roadmap, you know, thinking about what are the key elements, what are the best practices, um, and of course, reiteration is going to be important. So, you know, making sure that, you know, whatever um, is applied, we looked at how it's applied, and then if we need to go back and, and readjust and so on, that we're doing that. Um, there was also a point brought up in terms of um, considering this within the context of the end users and the stakeholders and ensuring that they have a voice and that their voice is heard. Um, this was also spoken about in the context of um, really getting the LMIC um, stakeholders to speak, to feel comfortable speaking up. Um, and I think that was presented in terms of language, language barriers, um, and ensuring that you know, we're hearing their voice as we're considering this. Um, training models was also something that was discussed. Um, and there was a, a lot of discussion around training, exchanges, making sure, for example, um, or how do we um, get someone who has a K-23 to work with a, a um, LMIC investigator who has a K-43 for example, and to have that exchange. And I think that was actually a model that was being considered by one of the um, presenters from this morning. Um, they haven't started it, but it's something that's under consideration that would allow that exchange of information and experience and expertise. Um, there were also other models discussed um, that would allow um, exchange um, or training in this area to, um, to occur. So someone mentioned maybe looking at the possibility of pairing the D43 with the T32 um, US training system. Someone else uh, mentioned maybe the D43 if you are one. And um, GeoHealth, the Global Environment and Occupational Health um, Program, for example, uses an U01, U2R link mechanism where the U01 is the research and the U2R is more focus about the trainee and the trainees um, are um, trained within the context of the research that's being done in the U01 and um, encouraging that exchange um, between um, LMICs and US investigators. And then one of the last issues that we spoke about was um, the issue of tech transfer and um, what that would look like. I think there were um, some challenges where um, someone described a challenge where they started um, work in Kenya, but the, it wasn't set up to support um, the US uh, networks. So they had to try and find other partners locally. There were issues related to costs. It was more expensive to implement in the US um, and so on. Um, there was another example um, that was presented in terms of um, low cost technology um, FOA that was done at the NCI um, and issues related to applying those low cost technologies, developing LMICs within US um, settings. You know, what are other considerations that we need to uh, think about when we're thinking about those types of models? Um, related to, um, I think someone mentioned legal um, uh, barriers. So thinking about, for example, FDA clearance and so on. And so maybe one thing that we could think about in, help, in helping to address tech transfer is maybe thinking about the SBIR um, funding um, model and thinking about um, bringing in those with tech expertise to help with, um, uh, in terms of um, helping with tech transfer uh, from LMICs to US um, populations uh, within our um, US settings. So I will stop there. And if anyone else has anything to add, please um, feel free to pipe in. And I hope I captured um, a summary of what we discussed. <laughs>
Any other input from anyone in group three or any other group? We still have nine official minutes. I thought the more this morning was was great. Um, I really want to thank all of the presenters um, for the great presentations. And I thought the discussion groups and the summaries were very interesting. We're going to keep going tomorrow, and I think we'll build on what we've learned today. And and um, I I think that this whole concept of this meeting was a great success. So thank you, Linda, for pulling it off, and thanks for everybody. And any final words? speak now or we'll see you tomorrow no this was wonderful and um thanks everyone and we'll see you tomorrow at 7 55.